So uh, let me let me introduce uh, Luigi Preziosi from Politecnico di Torino, who will talk about modeling strain-induced cell reorientation. Okay, uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> what I would like to do is to describe to you uh, what we have done uh, addressing this problem, that, uh, this experiment, this cluster experiment that is done in the field of mechanotransduction, or if you want, the response of cells to mechanical stimuli. Uh, so this is a joint work with uh, Chiara Giverso, Giulio Lucci, Nadia Loi, um, <clears throat> that have worked at the problem from this different respect. Um, so what I will do is, is first of all to describe with the, in some detail say the experiment and uh, some biological uh, say things that are important to understand the modeling. And then of course I will go to the modeling. I will not go into detail uh, into, and I will not be so detailed in the modeling uh, because there are several aspects that can be uh, caught by several models. So uh, if you want to, me to tell you more about the uh, modeling aspects, uh, just please ask also in uh, during the seminar. So this is um, the what is observed. Sorry. Okay. This is what is observed. What is done is that cells are put are placed in a in a substratum on a substratum uh, in a it's called subconfluent configuration. That is, they don't uh, touch or they barely touch. And the substratum is stretched along, say, the horizontal direction in this picture. And what is observed is that in some cases, cells orient more or less perpendicularly, uh, as in this case here, and in other uh, cells form an angle, say, in this, uh, on the bottom right uh, picture, they form an angle of more or less 45 degrees. Okay, and it's well defined. And of course, since there is no up and down in this picture, um, you have as many cells going, say, in the first quadrant and uh, in the fourth quadrant. And another symmetry that is characterizing this problem is that, of course, there is no head and tail in this case uh, for the cell. The cell is not moving, they are resting. And so, uh, say, uh, the angle theta, if you want an angle or the angle theta plus pi is just the same. Okay, and the amazing thing is that this behavior seems to be pretty robust from, uh, regardless of the type of cell involved. So this is the list of cells that I found in the literature that uh, show the same kind of behavior. Uh, but most interesting, uh, very interesting is the fact that there are some types of cells that do not respond in the same way. So this is a negative paper that I found in which the macrophages uh, do not uh, behave in the same way. Why is that? Well, uh, the main reason uh, suggested by this uh, experiment is the fact that macrophages have a, have a different role with respect to say fibroblast uh, endothelial cells. Endothelial cells, epithelial cells, they are all attached to substratum. Uh, they form strong addition bonds. They form, uh, they have a strong set of skeleton above all, uh, as well as fibroblasts and so on. The role of macrophages is different. They belong to the immune system. So they have to squeeze uh, through holes in um, arterial walls. They have to pass through the accessory matrix. They have to go everywhere and pretty fast. Instead, the type of migration of uh, the other cells, if they migrate like fibroblast, is quite, in some sense, they pull, they adhere, they accept traction forces and so on. So it seems that the critical role is played by the cytoskeleton. For those who uh, know little about this, uh, the cytoskeleton is a uh, more or less, it's a bunch, I mean, uh, of, fibers, essentially actin and microtubules, uh, that are connected uh, through, uh, say, several types of additional molecules uh, inside the cell. I mentioned here two types of additional molecules, linking molecules. Uh, one is, uh, say, um, filamin, 
filament takes two fibers and connects them, forming an angle of more or less 90 degrees. And the other one is RP23. Uh, more is not a linking molecule per se. I mean, the, they are just, it's more proper to say that they are branching molecules. It is where there is a molecule RP23, another filament branch from the main uh, filament. Okay, and they form uh, an angle with the, 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 the daughter of filament from the mother's filament, they form an angle that is well defined as close to 70 degrees. Okay. Then there are another class of um, cross linking molecules acting in timbering fashion. They take together the fibers, the acting fibers, and make bundles. So that this uh, becomes more robust. Uh, they link to the uh, focal additions, and they can exert uh, a lot of traction uh, because among these bundles, there are uh, myosins uh, motors that, that work and they exert traction. And you can see that here. In, uh, in the right figure, you see the uh, focal addition in uh, orange, more or less, in the fiber bundles uh, that connect focal additions in um, light green. Okay. And you can see the same thing forming in the experiment that I, mean, I was mentioning. And you can appreciate that I always try to put uh, the figure in such a way that the uh, stretch is always, the main stretch is always uh, from right to left. So you see that the excess fiber are uh, um, oriented perpendicularly to this direction, more or less. Uh, so the response to the cell is to first form acting fibers, then to orient them in uh, uh, this direction, this well-known direction. Then the cell, of course, keeps, I mean, takes this elongated shape. And the same thing is observed also in confluent condition. That is when you have epithelial sheets, uh, you have a lot of cells that touch each other, they form a tessellation of the substratum. Uh, and they can be either, say, oriented perpendicularly, like in the picture by Shirinsky, or at a certain angle. So it seems that uh, this, say, this is suggesting uh, a sort of mechanics of what happens in vivo, for instance, in the orientation of cells and of fiber bundles in the um, arterial walls, especially close to the, to the heart, in the, in the aorta, in the upper part of the aorta, that is subject to a lo lot of stretching of, I mean, of inflation and deflation. Okay, so this is the initial part. If there are questions, please ask. Uh, so let's go to the, say, well, I'm, I mean, it's not really the modeling yet, but I mean, in quantifying what is generally uh, described from the qualitative point of view, I would say. And the best um, set of experiments is done by Livne, who performs the ASIA test. It, it controls actually the, the formation in the X direction in the Y direction. Uh, in most of the other, um, in the other experiments, what they do is just to pull in one direction and they sometimes measure the deformation in the Y direction, but no, not always. So this is the deformation gradient. And the important thing is that this uh, epsilon yy is written as minus r epsilon xx, where r is called the biaxiality ratio. Okay, so it's more or less is the one that measures how um, is compressing the specimen in y when it's extended in x. Okay, and so this is the result. Uh, the dots in uh, diamonds and squares are uh, the experimental results and they seem all to align uh, along a straight line uh, in this strange parameter space. On the Y you have the square of the cosine of the angle that is formed by the cell with the main stretching direction. And on the uh, X axis you have this combination of uh, R, one over R plus one, okay? The dotted line is uh, the line corresponding to the minimal strain in the specimen. And so you can see that though this phenomenon is always, is sometimes called strain avoidance, it's not really the strain that plays a role. Uh, 
<clears throat> what we will show is that what is important is to minimize the elastic stress. Okay, and you find out this linear relationship. By the way, this was already uh, uh, argued by Livne express. Okay, uh, and this uh, slope is very well set. It's 1.26 or something. So to uh, understand what's uh, happening, uh, what what changes when we change R, um, <clears throat> this point here corresponding to R equals zero means that there is no deformation in the Y direction, which is a clamped specimen in which you are fixing, say the the size of the of the of the substratum along Y. Uh, this conversely is the one in which Epsilon y y is equal to minus epsilon x x, uh, and this where you have a lot of points here is the incompressible case in which uh, epsilon y y is equal to epsilon z z is equal to minus epsilon x x over two. Okay, then uh, this is the main range in which experiments are done. Uh, there are there is actually one experiment. Or probably two by done by you that work in in uh, extension both in x and in y corresponding to a negative r uh, while this uh, range below 0.5 would correspond to compressing also in y and this is not is not done of course in, from the mathematical point of view we can and we will um, look at this case but you know we don't have any experimental evidence of what happens in this case. <clears throat> the other amazing thing is that uh, the result is pretty robust with respect to the type of substratum that is used, uh, the type of cell already said, and the type of, uh, the type of deformation uh, that is applied in terms of amplitude and frequency. Uh, so you see, you change everything, you find the same thing. Okay, and this is, um, this must, there must be some very general rule that uh, governs that. This is true to a certain extent. The garden cell, I told you, there is an exception. Micropages do not do it. Probably other cells of the immune cell or the immune systems don't do it as well. Uh, the substratum uh, has to be stiff enough and uh, <clears throat> frequency has to be high enough and the amplitude has to be high enough. So at the end of the study, in this, in this space of parameters, say omega epsilon zero, which is the amplitude of the stretching amplitude in, uh, in young modules, whatever, uh, the region where this occurs uh, is this cube, this gray cube. Uh, in principle, you can go to very high frequency to have a very stiff, um, materials, uh, substrata, and doesn't change anything. You cannot go to very high, say, um, stretching amplitude uh, because otherwise cells die. Okay, you cannot stretch them too much. After some time, they undergo apoptosis. Uh, but I mean, 30% is already a regime in which, say, linear elasticity is at least questionable. Okay, so, uh, and what I will do now is to present some, uh, some modeling and then try to address also to give some hints of why there are these transition, if we cannot say that they are threshold, they are threshold. I mean, there are transitions uh, that say when the phenomenon will occur or not. So what we did <clears throat> is to describe this uh, ensemble of cells uh, as an orthotropic material. Uh, and we uh, then uh, <clears throat> introduce an elastic energy. Let's start now with an elastic energy that has an isotropic factors, this P here, which will not come into play because it's isotropic, uh, plus another part which depends on all the invariants that are characteristics of the, uh, say, the anisotropy, uh, anisotropic behavior of the cells, I4, I5, I6, I7, I and I8, can be quite general in principle. Um, 
you can do that, but uh, <clears throat> we will work with a uh, quadratic elastic energy in this invariant, uh, which I write here in a, uh, in a uh, compact way. Uh, so this case, the matrix of coefficient that is, that is uh, say in front of the, of the pair say of uh, invariance uh, I4, I8. And actually, uh, well, I'll tell you that later on. Uh, because of symmetry, what you get is that uh, some of the coefficient have to vanish. That is all the coefficient they couple, uh, for instance, I4 with I8 have to vanish because you have this symmetry condition that the angle theta and minus theta are uh, the same. So you see I4, for instance, depends on cosine square of theta, uh, cosine square of theta, cosine square of theta. Every, every uh, invariant I4 up to I7 have the right symmetry uh, <clears throat> that I was mentioned before. I8 does not, because when you change theta with minus theta, of course, the sign changes uh, sign. And so, <clears throat> and so uh, you can take I8 square, but not a combination of, for instance, I7 times I8. Though we did the analysis with all these invariants, in order to have some um, formulas that are, um, say, more manageable, let's forget about I5 and I7 for the moment, which are the invariants that depends on the uh, on C square, on the square of the Cauchy green uh, strain tensor. Okay. Uh, well, uh, before uh, you, uh, you don't see the, the, the okay, the other. So, uh, what I will say for this quadratic uh, elastic energy also for, also for other types of energy, like a punct type energy, which is typical of uh, the uh, biological materials. In which you have exponentials, but it doesn't change anything. Okay, so what will do we do? The first thing uh, to do is to look for, um, say, the equilibrium configuration, and this is classically done. You just compute the derivative of the energy. You uh, look for zeros of this for this energy, and you uh, find very easily that there are um, three terms. The first one, sine and cosine. The first two sine and cosine correspond to the equilibria in which the cell is either aligned with the direction of uh, stretching direction, the main stretching direction, and pi two is the one in which cell orient perpendicularly to the stretching direction. Then uh, you might also have a situation in which it is the square parenthesis that vanishes, and, and this corresponds to the oblique uh, configuration, to the oblique configuration. Okay, <clears throat> that is given by cosine square equal to something because in the in the parentheses you see that there is cosine square, cosine square, and sine square. That is of course a cosine square. So this is why you have that uh, the equilibrium orientation gives naturally the cosine square in terms of what, in terms of a parameter here or the case that uh, describes say the um, mechanical characteristics of the material, okay? All the mechanics is, is here. And uh, uh, another parameter, this one, which is a combination of how much you are stretching in the X direction in the Y direction. So this second one is related to how, what is the deformation that you are imposing? The first one is what is the behavior of the material? And the relation is linear, okay? And by the we will call this one one over alpha, uh, and the second one uh, lambda. Okay, and this lambda is a uh, <clears throat> is related to the one over one plus r uh, that was in the in the in leaveness uh, diagram. In the elastic in linear elasticity, this is exactly one over one plus r. Okay. So, 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 right. Excuse me, can I say, so this configuration yeah. is always present because you can always choose 
the direction so that even if the coefficients is big, one over half is big, that one is small, right? Or sorry. So you you need in order to this equilibrium to exist, uh, you need uh, to be less than one the right hand side. Yes. So, but in principle, one over alpha could be very big. Uh, I will discuss that in the, in, the, in the next slide. Yes, you have a certain range of alpha, uh -huh. so that this ob uh, oblique equilibrium appear or not. Okay, so you, so you cannot choose the, the orientation so that the, the, the second part is, is compensates the one over alpha. If, if alpha, uh, if alpha, let's see, if alpha is, uh, well, you will see in the diagram. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So this is the say the straight line in that in that diagram by Lee. and this is what uh, I was going to show. So you have that if we take alpha uh, larger than zero, okay, uh, then you have two situations. The first one is when it corresponds to the black line alpha greater than one. In which you have uh, a straight line that say uh, intersects the line cosine squared equal zero at a point at a value of lambda greater than one. So you see, for lambda capital lambda larger than say some value, very large value, you don't have this uh, this equilibrium, this oblique. Equilibrium. Okay, so it depends on, on this lambda. Uh, if alpha is between zero and one, instead you have the red line. I mean, from the mathematical point of view, it seems that there, are, uh, there is no difference, but I recall that what is an observed experiment that is this range one over two, one. Okay, so this is the important range here. <clears throat> So, uh, so this one is the uh, say pale blue region, the one that is tested experimentally. Okay, <clears throat> and it corresponds to the following configuration: say lambda equal one over two corresponds to the uh, forty-five degree orientation. Then you have something that is above forty-five degrees, and in this range you have only the vertical uh, orientation, the perpendicular orientation. It is observed in many experiments. So it seems that in most experiments, it is the red line that is um, physically true, biologically true, not the, not the black line. I will question that later on, but I mean, in most of the experiments, this is what, uh, what's happening. Uh, and you have two supercritical bifurcations here, because you are passing from stable, uh, equilibrium to another stable equilibrium, and then again another stable equilibrium. Okay, from the for the moment, let's uh, consider a bit the negative case, alpha negative. Uh, in principle, alpha can become negative in this setup when, say, uh, this coefficients k eight eight, k six six, and k four six uh, on the right of alpha are very large. Okay, in this case, uh, you have that the oblique equilibrium becomes unstable uh, and your bifurcation points uh, become super, super critical. Um, this seems to be a mathematical game at the, at the moment, but uh, later on, I, if I have time, I will show that this is related to the, uh, this will happen when, uh, when you, uh, have a soft substratum, so it might be an estimation. So let's uh, do some consideration. First of all, you see that, <clears throat> um, assume that the experiments give you a certain value of alpha, like the straight line by Lee. This means that this straight line can be obtained by a, a lot of combination of parameters uh, or mechanical parameters. Okay, so let's try to, uh, see what is the minimum number of parameters that give you this particular value of alpha. If all the values, say, but k44 are zero, so you take the simplest uh, orthotropic material, then this value of alpha is equal to one. 
trivially. Uh, if you have that k46 and k88 are zero, then you have that alpha is greater than one. But it corresponds to the black figure. But what is found is that this value of alpha measured is between, say, of the order of 0.8, it's below one. So one explanation uh, can be that you need to have that the combination of K46 and K88 has to be large enough, sufficiently large, uh, with respect to K60. Okay, this one way. Uh, there is another way to look at things is that to include a, a linear part in the, uh, in the elastic energy, it is to allow for uh, coupling parameters between isotropic invariance and inosotropic invariance. Uh, and this will lead to a modification of this formula, uh, which is the following. Okay, so there is uh, a, an addition to the denominator. Again, looking for the minimal set of parameters, if we eliminate everything, but K44 and K14, we can satisfy this relation. In particular, uh, this is satisfied when uh, the ratio between the coupling parameter between I1, the trace of the Cauchy Green strength tensor, and K44 is 0 0.06 or something. Okay. So we can fit the data by just uh, catching the parameter. Okay, um, so at the beginning I was mentioning that in principle you can have uh, terms in the elastic energy that are proportional to size square, it's a C square, uh, the square of the Cauchy-Green tensor. Um, is it worth it to include that? Now, if you include K55, uh, you find that you progressively detach from the experimental value. Uh, in particular, it can be good, but the value of K55 need to be much smaller than K44, say 0 0.01 with respect to 0.4. I mean, it's a, I mean, it's not worth to, to uh, do anything more complicated than before and to involve that. Uh, in K77, it is even worse because uh, you have a behavior which presents a minimum in the in the equilibrium curve that is not observed in, in the experiment. So this is certainly wrong, as well as using a transversely uh, isotropic material will uh, give you uh, an answer that is not really correct. So um, the <clears throat> final message from this, uh, from this analysis that K44 is of course important, probably K14 uh, is also important or alternatively, say for instance, K88 can give an answer to this. So uh, I was telling you now, the strange thing is that this alpha equal to say 0 0.8 uh, seems to be pretty universal, I would say, in the sense that there are three sets of experiments that um, coalesce, then they just align to the same uh, line, the red line. Uh, but this is, is this, the, is this, it is, uh, sorry. Is this true? Well, if you go back to this experiment by Wang, uh, that in words describe the or orientation as a, a perpendicular orientation, and, and look at the graph, uh, you see that I mean uh, the cell don't don't look to align perpendicularly to the main strain direction. In fact, in the graph, the maximum frequency is obtained for a value of theta, which is not 90, it's between 80 and 85 degrees. So this means we are in a clamped situation, R equals zero. So R equals zero means lambda equal one, capital lambda equal one. We are, we are here rather than on the, on the red line. So it's not 90 degrees, uh, but it's something less than 90. So this might suggest that endothelial cells used in this experiment have a different coefficient, a different slope than the fibroblasts using by Livne and by Faust uh, that are reported in the first graph that I showed. 
Okay, so there is some flexibility on this value of R. Of course, um, not all experiments are so detailed, so uh, it's very early to um, have a definite answer on that. Okay, now the, the next step, because what I, uh, I was doing till now is to look at the equilibrium uh, distribution at the equilibrium uh, value configuration is to look at how the system goes toward this equilibrium. Okay, and this is the temporal evolution that you find for the angle theta uh, as a function of time uh, for fixed value of R starting from uh, several uh, initial angle initial orientation. Instead, this is the case in which you change the value of, uh, of R by, by acceleration. Uh, the way to do that is just to say that in a friction dominated um, regime, uh, resorting to a sort of Lagrangian mechanics, the evolution of theta is related to the gradient of the, of the, of the elastic energy. Okay, if you do that, what you have is this one. We are not playing with anything. We are just putting the, the, the same elastic energy I was describing below, before, uh, putting some angles, and you see that the trend is quite similar to that that is it's obtained in the experiments. And this is what you uh, get starting from pi six when you change R. When you compare the the R of the color say matches uh, with the with the colors above. Okay. And now uh, the, and the, the next step is then to uh, see, to try to find an explanation of what happens when we change the amplitude and the frequency. What is found is this one, that if you increase the amplitude, uh, then the, the time to arrive to the equilibrium uh, decreases when you increase the amplitude. So the orientation time decreases, increasing the stretching amplitude. This can be already explained by looking at uh, the ODE that I was mentioning before, because there you have, apart from the function that depends on theta and on this lambda, this parameter lambda, uh, depends on a characteristic time, okay? And then in the numerator, you have epsilon square, and the epsilon square measures the uh, stretching amplitude. For instance, if you have R equal zero, if you're clamping and you are doubling epsilon, it means that the uh, characteristic time will become one fourth, okay? And in fact, this is coherent with some experiments. For instance, if you take uh, the a stretching of 50%, which takes a characteristic time to 10 minutes and you decrease by two thirds, square is four, ni four ninth. Four ninth means that the time should more or less double, and you have a doubling of the time. This is theoretical, the green one, and uh, the 22.2 is the experimental one. However, if you go to very low strains, this is not longer true, uh, in the sense that. If you have a strain that is one third, you should have a time that is nine times, and uh, uh, this is not, 58 minutes is not uh, 94.6, okay? And in fact, if you look at the graph, the green, uh, the green uh, dashed line is the theoretical one, which is good, say, for large amplitude, is not good for small amplitude. So we don't have an explanation uh, for what happens at low amplitudes, but we are quite happy to catch the behavior at large amplitudes. What happens instead when we increase the frequency? What is observed is that when uh, uh, we increase the frequency, the reorientation time decreases and they reach an asymptotic value. More or less, this asymptotic value is obtained for a frequency of one Earth. And below, say, 0.1 Earth, 0.2, uh, 0.05, uh, nothing is observed. Well, you know, till now the model is an elastic model. So in elastic model, uh, the response of cell is instantaneous. So uh, we cannot uh, pretend to describe uh, what happens when we change the, the frequency with an elastic model. 
we need to include a characteristic time in the model. That is, we need to take into account of some viscoelastic effect that might be present in the model. Where does viscoelasticity come, um, come seen from the, the biology? There are several sources. First of all, there is cytosol. Cytosol is a liquid, so there is a viscous dissipation, so there is a characteristic time of the cell say, uh, response. The second one is related to actin cytoskeleton, which is remodeling, is polymerizing and depolymerizing. So this means that there is a time of, of uh, polar, polar, polymerization and a time of depolymerization. Then there is a time of uh, turnover of the addition bond. And this is measured. These are all times of the order of say one minute, a hundred seconds. Depends on the stretching. No? The characteristic time is given by the red line in the, in the first graphs. And this depends on how uh, strong you stretch. So from this already, you can understand something. You can understand that if the stretching is very small, addition, the lifetime of addition bond is small. So the cells have enough time to remodel and to adapt to the stretching. Okay, so that's why qualitatively, you don't see anything for very slow deform for very slow in terms of frequency for very slow deformation. Instead, for a very high deformation, the bones are stronger, last a lot, and so the cell has to react. React in a viscoelastic way, which means that we have to go to a viscoelastic model. And this is what we use. It's a, a memory. Uh, the stress is given as a memory integral of the, um, over the previous strain, uh, the previous orientation, theta zero tau, and the, uh, the exponential is just a, the kernel. We take one, just one kernel with one uh, single relaxation time. Uh, and classically, uh, as it is classically done, come on, okay. As it is classically done in, uh, in uh, viscoelasticity, uh, what you have is that you can write this in a, as a set of uh, differential equations, okay? And you have a Maxwell norm, where this curly C naught is just a weighted, say, average of the over the past orientation. In this characteristic time, the relaxation time, lambda that is present there, uh, is related to, uh, for instance, addition turnover. Focal addition turnover of the order of minutes. And we have to compare that with 0.1, uh, the frequency of 0.1 second, okay? Or a period that is more or less one minute, tenths of second. In fact, in the limit of high frequency, high frequencies, what you have is that, of course, the model uh, converts toward, say, uh, an elastic model. As classical in this classicity. Uh, so the stresses become in phase with the strain. Instead, in uh, uh, a low frequency regime, what you have is that the stress is out of phases. Uh, you have here I lambda omega in front of, uh, of the strain. So the stress is more related to the derivative of the strain. So we are, you have a we viscous regime. And this explains a bit the, the dichotomy of this uh, behavior. I mean, if the frequency is very high, then the response is very elastic. So what we have done till now with the model holds true. If the frequency becomes critically low, then uh, this is no longer true. Uh, and we have a viscous like regime. Okay, now, so we can go to the uh, uh, comparing to what happens at the uh, evolution of theta in the high frequency regime, which is more or less very similar to what we've seen before, but from the fact that you have these small wiggles, I mean, this uh, uh, wavelets uh, on the top of the main trend toward the equilibrium values. Uh, these are the equilibrium values 
evaluated by the, 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 the elastic analysis. Uh, if you lower the frequencies, uh, then it takes longer, much longer to go to the equilibrium value. Uh, take into account that the experiment lasts uh, three hours, six hours, not more than that. Uh, so uh, that's why if you use a, a low frequency, say a omega equal to 0 0.001, at the end of your experiment, you don't see anything at all. And you say, okay, there is nothing. This is one way of looking at things. The other one uh, will be explained at the end of the, of the seminar where I will introduce the uh, stochastic effect, randomness. And so randomness destroys this tendency of, of going toward the field. So you can measure at this point the velocity of uh, orientation, this Vm on the, uh, on the right, this one. Uh, on top right, and you have a transition. For very low frequency, you don't have, the velocity is very small, extremely small. And then you have a, a very high frequency, instead you have a constant velocity. Uh, and you compare the time with the graph that is given experimentally. And so the graph here on the bottom, the red uh, triangles are the experimental values. And the uh, blue line is what we have with our model. So it's pretty good. I mean, to our uh, norm of the eye. Okay. And this square, the last one, this square, this triangle, the last one where they see uh, the, um, the appearance of this the orientation corresponds more or less to this transition here. Below that, you will. Uh, uh, run below this transition point. And so this might be an explanation of why uh, nothing is there. Uh, OK, let me see. OK, regarding the uh, effect of the stress uh, of the substratum, the fact that uh, no orientation is observed when the substratum is too soft, or there are some papers by Tondon that says that when the substratum is soft, then the angle is theta is zero, that is the cells tend to align along the stretch direction. Uh, this can be done. We go back to uh, the elastic model and uh, say describe the material as a mixture of say a, an orthotropic component and an in, uh, isotropic in part, which is the, the elastic part. Uh, what happens is that the result is more or less the same, but for the fact that this uh, coefficient in front that was alpha before uh, is a term that I called S uh, for sub substratum uh, that takes into account of the steepness of the substratum. And in this coefficient, there is a minus sign, an important minus sign, so it can become negative. So this alpha, in some sense, this the alpha is. Uh, everything here. Uh, this alpha is uh, uh, can become negative. So we have a situation in which we can jump from uh, uh, a sub super critical uh, say regime to a supercritical regime, in which there is no oblique configuration. There is only the alpha equal zero uh, configuration, the alpha equal pi half configuration. Is two, okay? And we have a, a transition from uh, a sub, super critical, subcritical, which is sometimes called a, a, a cast cathode, a cast cathode. Okay, uh, and this is the graph of what happens at the equilibrium when you change these two critical parameters. One is uh, Ks, the coefficient that has to do with the substratum, and K theta, is the response to shear, if you want. So if the response to shear is uh, high, then you have only uh, the equilibrium theta equal zero and theta over p over two. Uh, if Ks is steep, then you have the oblique equilibrium that is possible, the red part of this graph. The yellow one corresponds to only the equilibrium pi over two, which is steep.
Okay. Uh, good. Now, uh, the thing that I uh, didn't mention till now is the fact that as in all biological um, phenomena, I mean, nothing is deterministic. Okay. All, all that is happening till now is very deterministic. And instead, the typical graph that you see in the papers are histograms uh, that give you the frequency of orientation in terms of the angles. Okay. So, in order to describe that, what we did, I mean, no, before saying that, you see that. For instance, you can see in this experiment by one that if you decrease the amplitude, you have a, a distribution of angles that is flatter. In some sense. Okay, and this also uh, seen here. Okay. Um, before going on, uh, let me just mention one a small point that is a, a causing, I mean, it caused a lot of confusion to me. Uh, these distributions, that of course are not in uh, minus infinity plus infinity, uh, have a mode, a maximum that is not, does not correspond to the mean. And most of the papers describe the mean. Okay, they, give, they say, okay, the mean orientation is 45 degrees. Okay, the mean orientation of this first graph on the right without any strain by definition is 45 degrees. Okay, but doesn't tell you anything. Okay, this is just a small comment because uh, I will then uh, comment on that later on. Uh, so, what happens? These are three experiments by Hayakam, Wa, and Mao. In the first one, you see the distribution of orientation with time in the top one. Uh, the yellow is the, the initial one, which is pretty flat, okay? The uniform distribution. And with time, you see the, the picking up of the distribution, okay? Till you have a uh, equilibrium distribution after three hours. The uh, bottom figures refer to the equilibrium distribution when you change uh, the stretching amplitude on the left and on the right, the frequency. And you see that if you increase the stretching amplitude, you pick up, you pick up the distribution as well as if you increase the frequency. Okay, how can we uh, do that? Of course, we have to handle, uh, we have to introduce a probability densities give a distribution as a function of theta with some symmetries because this uh, distribution is pi periodic and it's also symmetric. I mean, f of theta and f of pi minus theta or f minus theta is the same. So they are uh, symmetric. Okay? And uh, we can write Hoker Planck equation for the uh, giving rise to this, uh, the evolution equation for this f. And the first thing to notice here is the fact that there are two terms. One is the classical diffusion term uh, that is a sigma square, which is the intrinsic noise, is related to the intrinsic noise of, of the system. And the one, another one is the drift term that <clears throat> is given by the derivative of the elastic energy with respect to theta. Okay. And the first thing to notice is the fact that this drift term has in front an epsilon square. So the stronger is the um, is the stretching, the largest is the stretching, uh, the faster you go toward the equilibrium. I mean, and you actually, uh, the drift term, I mean, is, is important, okay? Uh, with respect to the, to the diffusion term. Um, and in fact, you have an equilibrium distribution for this term here, which is the exponential of the of your uh, elastic energy, whatever it is, that tells you that the minima of the energy corresponds to the maximum of this equilibrium distribution, to the modal distribution. And this sigma bar here, the denominator that describes how peak is this, this distribution is uh, the intrinsic is the one that is related to the intrinsic noise divided by epsilon. The sigma square is epsilon square. So again, uh, 
the more the la largest is the deformation, uh, the more peak is your equilibrium distribution and as in the graph that I showed before and I compared here. So this is the, the trend toward equilibrium that, you know, again, in the norm of the eye, it, it looks very similar. Uh, and this is uh, the matching of the experimental value, the experimental histograms with our, say, base shape uh, distribution in zero to pi, in zero, uh, sorry, zero pi, okay, zero 180 degrees, or in Faust on the right, they describe it in zero uh, pi over two. And so we have uh, a distribution that is, uh, in sense, skewed, okay? And you can see that the difference, the red, I don't know if you can see that, but the red dot uh, corresponds to the mean, uh, which is the one that is uh, uh, stated by Faust, and uh, a blue one corresponds to the mode, the maximum mode distribution. Of course, when you have a, a higher, say, strains, the mean and the mode becomes uh, closer. Okay, so that's it. What are we doing now? Well, first of all, we are trying to uh, do something on understanding what happens when we change uh, the, the frequency in the kinetic model. In order to do that, we have to uh, do the complete, say, dynamics uh, of, the, of the angle, so the stochastic prediction. Uh, then, uh, and this is what this Nadia Law is doing, Giulio and, uh, and Chiara is working at the evolution of the inner structure to describe this evolution of the orientation of stress fibers as a remodeling process, an inner remodeling process. And then Marco Shan and, and Anna Chiara Colombia are working at a discrete model that describes the cell as a set of say, spring and dashboard. Uh, each one has its own role in to uh, describe the things in this in form of these elements here. And uh, I will conclude here and I thank you for your attention. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? I have a question. And uh, uh, maybe there are uh, actually are two questions, but I think they are related. Um, so you, the angle you, you consider its dependence on time. Is it conceivable that also to consider dependence on, on space? Uh, meaning that uh, uh, maybe you, you might have, or and the other question is maybe you have configurations in which there are patches in which you have one orientation and other patches in which uh, you have other orientation. So if there is some kind of instability uh yes uh hmm. if i had time i could open you an experiment when you stretch uh, a rectangle what you have is the necking down at the center right mm -hmm. something like that because you are keeping the sides uh fixed the right and the left and you have something that is going like that so in principle in different places you have different orientation so people focus on the central region, but there are some experiments in which they also give the mean orientation on the sides. And you see that the orientation depends on space. Because of course the principal direction depends on space. It's not a pure uniaxial tension. Mm -hmm. So this is true. Uh, another thing that is done is in 3D, but 3D is, uh, uh, is a bit different. Mm -hmm. In some sense, but you have different orientation according to uh, whether the sets are in the core of your cube or on the, on the, on the surface. And does the cell feel the orientation of the neighboring cells? Somehow, in confluence, in confluence, they do. Uh, there is a sort of crosstalk, uh, so mm. that they they are faster in aligning. Mm -hmm. And of course, there is another thing that has to do with static uh, behavior, because if you, your neighbor is straightening up, then you are more likely to uh, follow the same line. 
So for instance, when you are not in conference, you have uh, the angle theta and minus theta, which are the same, but when you are in conference, you cannot put like that. You probably prefer to do something like this because there is a symmetry breaking if you want. So you prefer one with respect to the other. And the, the, the equilibrium configuration you had uh, for the kinetic model, um, I mean, it's, uh, I think it's, it's a, a global one. It's, it's a, uh, in principle, can that one, the sort of uh, equilibrium could depend on, on space itself, right? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the, the equation then has to change because we are only considered the distribution function as a function of, of time and theta. And theta. Okay. But you have to take into account that since the cell are, cells are not moving, X is a parameter. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Are there any questions? So thank you again. And uh, let's have a, a little break. Uh, we will start again in uh, uh, what about Marco? Five, like four, five? Four, four or five minutes. We started. Okay, in four five or five, minutes. something like that. Okay. Let me introduce Cinzia Soresina from Universität Graz, who will talk about multistability and time periodic spatial patterns in the cross diffusion. SKT model. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, I want to thank, first of all, the organizer for the invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure to speak in this uh, online series of seminar. Um, my talk is, uh, I want to say that my talk is related to the rendezvous last one uh, last week. Oh, sorry. And uh, it also relates to previous work of uh, uh, San Martino Lombardo e Gambino. Um, this is a, um, ah, and feel free to interrupt me if you have a question during the, the talk. So this is part of a project which uh, I carry out at the Technical University of Munich. Uh, and it's a joint work with uh, Christian Kuhn uh, here and Maxim Breden. Um, and here you can see the, um, the mathematical department at the Technical University of Munich, which is really nice. You have uh, two giant slides and you can slide out on the third floor. And uh, the last part of the talk uh, is uh, uh, a work that I developed uh, during my uh, last year in Graz. The, uh, the project is about uh, bifurcation in PDEs, and especially those systems which present fast reactions and cross diffusion terms. And it's an interesting topic, at least from my point of view, uh, because it, it interfaces uh, different uh, mathematical aspects uh, from PDE theory, bifurcation theory, in particular Turing instability analysis, and also numerics, because there is a strong component uh, of numerical continuation methods uh, through the uh, software, continuation software PDE to pass, which is uh, developed for um, PDE systems, which is based on a finite element discretization of uh, the, the equations. The goal of the project uh, is to study the low role cross diffusion terms in pattern formation, and in particular, to, to understand how the bifurcation structure of this system behaves and modifies under parameter variations. And uh, it's, I think, uh, some motivation uh, to study this topic uh, because uh, from the theory, uh, theoretical point of view, obtaining rigorous results uh, for system which involves such reaction or cross diffusion, it's uh, more challenging. Uh, there is a strong component, uh, strong motivation from the modeling point of view, because these cross diffusion terms uh, can be justified and derived through mechanistic derivation. Uh, so also their meaning can be uh, explained in this way. 
and uh, also from the path formation point of view, because cross diffusion terms uh, seems to be leading uh, the key ingredients uh, in pattern formation. So uh, we have so called cross diffusion inducing instability, even when uh, with standard diffusion is not possible. And we started from the observation that standard diffusion terms sometimes might not be the right way to uh, describe population interaction. So just adding diffusion to, uh, let's say, ODE system might not be the uh, right way to understand the several phenomena. And I will show you. So what I'm talking about uh, today is a competition model, the SKT model, which uh, Laurent presented last week. Um, so we will consider uh, two species competing for the same resource. I will introduce the ODE system uh, and then uh, the PDE system with standard diffusion. Uh, then we will uh, see uh, what happens when cross diffusion terms and why cross diffusion terms um, are added. Uh, they induce uh, cross diffusion uh, instability. And then uh, I will talk about uh, some results about the weak competition case in the full cross diffusion uh, system. So not only in the triangular case when uh, just one cross diffusion uh, term is added. And uh, at the end, uh, I will show you that uh, varying some parameter we may have multi stability and all bifurcations in the uh, bifurcation diagram. So briefly, um, let's start with the ODE model for competing species. It's rather simple. Uh, it involves uh, um, lot of terra terms. And uh, so we consider two species denoted by U and V, uh, the population density uh, over time, and they compete for the same resource. And we have uh, the growth uh, term. And then we have also intraspecific competition and interspecific competition. Uh, so between individuals of the same species or uh, of the two competing ones. And uh, it's uh, uh, easy to see that the system admits uh, uh, the total extinction and two non coexistence uh, equilibria, where only one of two species survive, survives. And we may also have a coexistence equilibrium under some uh, parameter constraint. And we uh, have two different regimes, uh, the weak competition case um, uh, with uh, this uh, uh, inequality, when the, the parameters fulfill this uh, inequality. In this case, uh, uh, we have that the, the total extinction is unstable. The two non-coexistence equilibria are, are unstable when the coexistence uh, one exists and the coexistence equilibrium is stable of course, when it exists, and it exists under an additional um, uh, constraint on the parameter. And in this case, we have the coexistence of the species, uh, of the two species um, over time. In the strong competition case, so uh, on the reverse, we have a reverse inequality, we have the total extinction is always unstable again, but uh, the coexistence equilibrium is unstable when it exists, and the two non-coexistence equilibria are um, stable. So in this case, the uh, outcome is the competitive exclusion principle. So only one of the two species survive. But uh, the OD model just tells you the abundance, the densities of the population over time. Sometimes it's also interesting to see what happens uh, if you look at spatial distribution. And there is an interesting phenomenon which is called uh, spatial segregation, which happens uh, when two similar species coexist on the habitat, but they occupy different regions. Or when one species, uh, the abundance of one species um, uh, force the other one to decrease. And this uh, can be, this uh, spatial segregation can be due to territoriality or aggressiveness, or just as an outcome of interspecific competition for the same resource. And this has been observed in uh, several um, animal species. And just, uh, I, want, I, I found these two examples in literature. This one uh, is related to uh, two different type of uh, gibbons. Uh, and as you can see, one type leaf, uh, lives here and the other type lives in the other part of the habitat. 
and the same for uh, two different type of oaks, uh, one also in uh, Sicily, and they seem to segregate, so to occupy different region of habitat. So what we want to uh, see from our um, PD system, from our model, uh, let's uh, think to 1D domain, our solution like this. So one, when one species is more abundant, the other one is less abundant. So we want uh, what I'm going to uh, call non-homogeneous solution of the system. So the first attempt can be to just take the right hand side, so the OD system, and to put um, standard diffusion terms, which, um, so now the quantity U and V depends also on the, on the space. And we assume that the two species uh, are confined, so they cannot escape. So from now on, we will consider homogeneous diamond boundary conditions. And so if we just add a standard diffusion term to the system, we can, as been, as it has been proved that uh, on a convex domain and especially non constant equilibrium solution are unstable. And if you perform the Turing instability analysis, you see that this system does not present the activator inhibitor structure. So uh, the diffusion is not able to destabilize the homogeneous steady state. So what uh, is to summarize, so this model cannot exhibit spatial segregation. So cannot exhibit Turing instability. So we have to modify our system and uh, it has been uh, proposed in literature to add extra diffusion terms. Um, in addition to uh, standard diffusion, which uh, models random movements of individual on the habitat, we may consider also additional uh, cross diffusion terms due to the interaction and competition. So extra repulsive effects between individual of different species, uh, these two terms, and extra dif uh, diffusion uh, repulsive effect between individual of the same species, which uh, are called self diffusion terms. And of course, the question is, first of all, um, how can we uh, interpret these cross diffusion and self diffusion terms? And also, um, can they destabilize the homogeneous equilibrium in order to obtain this uh, solution, which uh, models the spatial segregation of the species? And uh, if you just consider the triangular case, so you neglect self diffusion terms and cross diffusion terms in the in the second equation so we have just one cross diffusion term here you can oops um, you can see that uh, the system can be um, destabilized the homogeneous state can be destabilized but first of all i want to show you how you can um, in interpret these cross diffusion terms because you can uh, obtain so the right uh, these uh, cross diffusion terms as a singular limit. So they appear in the singular limit of a fast reaction system in which you split into two states. Uh, let's say the first equation, the first species, uh, it exists in two states, a quiet state and excited state. And you assume that there is a switch uh, between the two states due to the presence of the competing species. So uh, due to the presence of B. And this switch is modeled by these terms here. And if you assume that the switch happens on a faster time scale than the other processes, the competition and uh, the reproduction, so you can perform at least for a form, on a formal level, let's say, um, quasi steady state approximation. And in the limit, you recover uh, with suitable uh, um, transition rates the triangular cross diffusion system that uh, I showed you before, which is called triangular SKT model. So in this term, um, in this sense, uh, this is justify the, the, the expression of this, the presence of the cross diffusion terms. So we, which models the competition and the, fat, the, the species try to avoid each other. So, um, it has also, uh, also been shown, shown that um, if you only add one cross diffusion term 
here, let's say in the first equation, this is enough to destabilize the homogeneous equilibrium and uh, the so-called cross diffusion driven instability appear. So uh, you, you see that the system uh, when uh, D12 is large enough uh, and D, so in this case, we consider the same diff standard diffusion coefficient for both uh, species. Uh, when D is small enough and D12 is large enough, then stable and homogeneous steady states appears. So the homogeneous solution uh, is destabilized. But uh, this uh, uh, can be uh, seen from uh, linearized analysis, so Turing instability analysis, and we have information uh, only close to the homogeneous branch. To see what happens uh, more, let's say, globally, in the sense of uh, far from the homogeneous branch, we have to look at bifurcation diagrams. And in this case, uh, I used the software, continuation software PD to pass to uh, detect and continue bifurcation points and then the branches. So in this case, uh, I want, I'm showing the uh, bifurcation diagram of the um, triangular case uh, on a 1D domain. And um, in this case, uh, we have uh, the bifurcation parameter is D, so the standard diffusion coefficient. And on the uh, reference quantity here is the value of the species B at the right, uh, left boundary. And in this case, you see that, so when D, or, so all the other parameters are fixed and we only vary D. And if you, D is, uh, let's say large enough, the homogeneous branch, which is um, the black uh, line, denoted by the black line is stable, uh, it's denoted by a thick line. And if you decrease D, there is a first bifurcation point here. And uh, the homogeneous branch is destabilized where for a smaller value of D and non-homogeneous solution uh, appears, stable non-homogeneous solution appears. So if you decrease even more D, other bifurcation points appears in the system, in the bifurcation diagram, and other branches uh, comes out. Uh, and they can, uh, so they are unstable at the beginning, but they uh, restabilized uh, far from the homogeneous branch. And here you see the same diagram, but uh, we have uh, now the uh, L2 norm of, uh, of species U. And you'll see that uh, the branches, so it's the same diagram, but the branches overlaps because of some symmetries. And I hope uh, you see the video. So in this case, uh, I want to show you the shape of the solution on the branches. In, so I'm varying the bifurcation parameter T. So these solution are varying with the, with the parameter, not uh, with time. And if you move along the bifurcation curves, you see that the solution deforms. And if you change uh, branches, then you have a different shape. And in this case is stable and they deforms if you decrease it. And also here you have, uh, let's say some symmetries as I, and also here, so uh, at, at each bifurcation point, half a bump is at, at the solution. So what you can, so the first thing that we have done is to change the bifurcation parameter. So we selected D, uh, R1 now, which appears in the right-hand side and is the growth rate of uh, the first species. And the interesting thing that uh, we found is that, um, stable and homogeneous solution survives in a region in which the homogeneous solution becomes negative. So in this uh, case, uh, we have uh, the homogeneous solution is no longer meaningful, but still we have a stable non-homogeneous solution uh, which are present. And in this, so usually um, at, le at, at least uh, as far as I know, uh, we have, uh, studied the system only in uh, a region in which the uh, coexistence equilibrium state is uh, um, stable for the reaction part, exists and is stable. 
So this is something um, interesting um, to see. But what we wanted to understand is um, the role of a second cross diffusion term. Um, so not only in the um, triangular case, but also in the full cross diffusion case. So the, we started from the, so, so we thought, okay, but uh, if one cross diffusion term helps to uh, destabilize the system, the second one should help even more. But uh, as already pointed out in paper by Gambino, Lombardo, San Martino, it's not the case. So it seems that the second cross diffusion terms actually reduces uh, the parameter region in which the um, non-homogeneous steady states uh, appear. And in particular, you can also compute an analytical threshold under which all the bifurcation points uh, are, cannot exist, are not present, and the whole bifurcation structure uh, disappear. So in, when D to one is too large, then you may, uh, you cannot have uh, uh, cross diffusion induced instability. But this is something that comes out from the linearized analysis. And again, uh, we want also to see what happens um, far from the homogeneous branch. So we want to look at how the bifurcation structure deforms if you decrease, if you sorry, increase the second cross diffusion coefficient d two one. So in this case, we fix uh, d one two. Is uh, the parameter values are taken uh, from other uh, paper, and we just increase d two one from zero, so the, from the triangular case to the threshold. So the analytical threshold that we can compute from the linearized analysis. So we see that as predicted uh, by linearized analysis, the bifurcation points um, decreases, so it tends to zero. The bifurcation structure, of course, shrinks, tends to shrink uh, to the left. But uh, some interesting things happened. Uh, in particular, the first bifurcation point from supercritical becomes sub subcritical. And uh, this leads to uh, multi-stability region. So uh, we have a parameter range in which the homogeneous solution coexists with two um, sta is stable and coexists with a stable non-homogeneous uh, solution. And uh, this software also detects um, off bifurcation points here, which can, may lead to uh, time periodic spatial patterns. And um, of course, so uh, we know that from the analysis, analysis all the bifurcation points uh, decreases and then the bifurcation structure disappear uh, at the threshold. So here I just sketched um, the bifurcation structure, the first two branches. Uh, as I said, um, the first bifurcation point from supercritical, so this case become subcritical here, but also the second cross the few, uh, the, sorry, the second uh, bifurcation point uh, from supercritical becomes subcritical when you increase uh, D to one. So the first thing that I uh, wanted to uh, quantify, let's say, uh, is this change. So to, to detect this uh, change uh, from supercritical super to subcritical. And in this case, uh, I just uh, applied uh, the approach uh, presented in this paper by Gambino Lombardo San Martino 2012, but with respect to a different parameter. So my bifurcation parameter is D. So I took D as uh, uh, the parameter for the expansion here. So in this case, we want to perform weekly nonlinear analysis. And uh, uh, of course, uh, the parameter that I've chosen uh, is involved in the linear part. Uh, in this case, uh, the bilinear uh, part does not present the, bifurc the, bifurc the parameter. But uh, the, um, sorry, the um, computation and the approach uh, works in the same uh, way. Um, and what we uh, found is uh, the stuart Landau equation at the end. And uh, uh, as in the other paper, um, the sign of the L uh, gives you uh, 
the type of bifurcation. And in particular, if L, in this case, if L is positive, then the bifurcation is supercritical. And when L is negative, then the bifurcation is subcritical. Because, yeah, uh, of the, sign, uh, the sign of sigma in this case is reversed, uh, is uh, opposite of the other figure. And um, so I wanted to uh, see this change. And uh, so I wanted to see what happens uh, close to the bifurcation points, especially what happens uh, for the one mode and two mode, because they give me the two, first two bifurcation points. And uh, this is, I, uh, um, I plotted the sign of L. So the red belongs to the supercritical case and the uh, green, the subcritical case. And uh, here you have uh, the parameter D and here the, the second cross diffusion coefficient D to one. And these curves are the uh, neutral stability curves. So the, they are the curves of pictured bifurcation points in the uh, plane D, D to one. So basically are the points. So if you select the two eigenvalues, first two eigenvalues, lambda one and lambda two, um, these are the cores where the determinant of the characteristic matrix, so the Jacobian uh, evaluated the equilibrium state uh, minus the uh, eigenvalue of the Laplacian times the uh, linearized part of the diffusion uh, is zero. And you see that uh, we are, if you look at uh, uh, increasing value of D to one, we see that here you have so in this case, D1, 2 is fixed. And you see that we pass from a situation in which both uh, bifurcations are super critical. Then there is one change here uh, on the first branch. And then uh, after, so if you increase even more D2, 1, uh, also the second bifurcation point change. And then there is this crossing point uh, when the two uh, bifurcation points uh, switch position. But um, what can be also see, and this relates to a paper from uh, Izuara and Kobayashi, uh, they studied the presence, they proved the existence of a hope bifurcation point um, in the triangular case. And they uh, related the presence of a hope bifurcation points to this doubly degenerate point. So in this case, I'm still uh, plotting the uh, neutral stability curves so, but in this time in the plane D, D12. So again, on the curves, you have the bifurcation points and this is the one mode and this is the two mode and so on. And you see that uh, the one mode and two mode crosses here. This is, uh, they call it double degenerate point. And uh, they prove the existence of a whole bifurcation point close to this um, double degenerate point. And in the triangular case, at least for the parameter that I uh, considered, we are placed here. So in which we first see the first bifurcation, so the one mode, bifurcation point relates to a one mode and then the two mode, et cetera. But if you decrease, so, sorry, if you increase D to one, um, so, okay, sorry, I forgot to say that, yes, the all bifurcation points here, um, can be detected. They detected it using uh, auto, the continuation software auto, and they uh, proved the, that uh, the um, time periodic solution arising from this op bifurcation point are stable, and they look like this. But what uh, I found is that if you increase the second cross diffusion coefficient, uh, of bifurcation, uh, of bifurcation point appears also uh, for this value of D12. And exactly what happens if you um, increase D21 is that the neutral stability curves are shifted up. So if you fixed your parameter here in this green line, basically it seems that you come closer and closer to the double degenerate point. So this may uh, be the uh, reason to the appearance of 
the um, pop bifurcation points. So what I did is to uh, just plot the sign of the coefficient L on these neutral stability curves. And uh, so this is the uh, triangular case. Uh, so the case uh, of uh, the paper by Hirofumi and Kubayashi. And you see that here, so as we know, the bifurcation points are both supercritical. Then there is uh, the uh, double degenerate point. So if you decrease D12, and uh, you see that here, uh, the sign of L at the double degenerate point becomes uh, negative. So there is a switch between positive and negative at the double degenerate point. And here, is a sketch of what happens close to the double degenerate point. Uh, and in particular, we know uh, that stable uh, period time periodic uh, spatial pattern appears below this double degenerate point. So for D12, which are um, under the threshold, under uh, the point here. So what happens if you increase uh, D21? It seems that this region in which so this green region uh, after the um, the crossing point uh, tends to uh, shrink, so gets smaller and smaller, and uh, it seems to be uh, a value in, at which um, so this uh, the sign becomes uh, zero. No, sorry, L becomes zero. And after that, so this, after the threshold, you see that uh, the change happens for greater value of D. So this sign uh, becomes positive, uh, negative here. And then the, here is more evident if you uh, increase uh, even more the um, second cross diffusion coefficient. And the interesting point is that uh, when you uh, pass, so when you uh, are above this threshold, um, of bifurcation points can be detected uh, both above and below these double degenerate points, but they seem to be to generate unstable time periodic patterns. So this is uh, a change in the structure of uh, the uh, full cross diffusion system. And here is a just a sketch of what happens. So here you have. Um, the first case um, when the sign happens for at this side, and we have uh, in this case uh, stable limit cycles, so stable time periodic solution. And in this case, uh, so after the threshold, after the double degenerate point, you have a different structure. Uh, but whole bifurcation points are detected both uh, above and below the double degenerate point. And um, so this is to say that, uh, okay, it seems that it reduces, but interesting thing happens and it's not uh, still not clear what is really the, um, the role of a second cross diffusion coefficient. And um, in particular, in this case, uh, so in the triangular case, you can prove the existence of a bifurcation point. We tried to adapt the, the, the proof but uh, uh, at the threshold, so there are, there is, uh, so the proof is based on center manifold reduction, and uh, there is a necessary condition which fails exactly at uh, the threshold which I detect uh, via the weakly nonlinear analysis the sign on the, w, the on the neutral stability curves. So it's still not clear if it's uh, um, coincidence or if it's something uh, related to the presence of a higher co-dimensional point, uh, bifurcation point, because here I'm uh, varying three parameters. So it seems related to this higher co-dimensional uh, bifurcation point. And just to mention uh, what happens in the um, strong competition case. So here um, you see uh, this is not just one bifurcation diagram. Uh, I'm just I'm plotting the first branch um, for different value of D21. So I'm increasing D21, obtaining different branches. So also in this case, we know that the bifurcation structure tends to disappear if we increase D21. But again, 
So it's not uh, something that you, uh, an information that you have close to the homogeneous branch, uh, but uh, it seems that uh, interesting things uh, happen when you increase uh, this value to the threshold. And in particular, uh, the uh, stability region here. So again, um, you have that the homogeneous solution is always unstable. So uh, it cannot be destabilized uh, via uh, cross diffusion. But uh, if you continue from the first bifurcation point, then you see that there is a stable uh, region and uh, also a bifurcation point here. And this stable region uh, where uh, non-homogeneous uh, solution appears is reduced uh, when you increase D to one. But at a certain point, uh, you gain uh, this stability um, region again. Um, so here, the points are really shrinking to so going to zero. But this stable uh, non-homogeneous solution survives. Sorry, Cinzia. So yes. these stable branches are of stationary solutions? Yes. Those are possible. Yes. Okay. Yes, I. I, I I still I don't know um, don't know about the uh, time periodic. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can continue. You haven't followed the the whole bifurcation. Yeah, not yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. So maybe you also could have some oscillating solutions. Yes. Yes. But mm -hmm. Up to now, so uh, I know that this. So there is a whole bifurcation point, but. Uh, I don't know if the solution, the time periodic solution are stable or not, and I don't know what happens. So uh, if it's something similar to the other case, so they are stable and then they become unstable. So it's not uh, something that I'm not. Uh, and, do you have a, and you know about the form of the stationary solution because those are not Turing patterns. Sorry? Uh, I mean, those uh, stationary, so the, the stationary branches to which uh, form of solution uh, do yes, the... I have, I have a video. Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. yes. Uh, so here, the stationary solution are of this uh, type. Yeah. So again, related to the first mode. And then they, if you move along the first branches then they become so unstable here and then And then here it's too small. There are some problems in the continuation. So this is uh, to say that um, from a linearized analysis, we have information that uh, the second cross diffusion coefficient tends to reduce the region, but uh, other uh, interesting and still not, uh, at least for me, not well understood phenomena may happen. And uh, to conclude, so we studied the influence of cross diffusion terms in the formation, uh, combining linearized analysis, weakly nonlinear analysis, and bifurcation diagrams through the software PD to path. Um, we found some interesting uh, solution which survives uh, when the, uh, the homogeneous solution is no longer positive and they are related to a different bifurcation parameter. And also we studied the presence of multi-stability and open bifurcation um, points. Uh, it seems related to a higher co-dimension bifurcation point when you increase uh, D to one. So when you increase D to one, yes, it reduces, but you may observe uh, also multi-stability. Uh, yes, I haven't said it yet. Okay. Also here, uh, yeah, you have multi-stability of solution in both cases. And uh, what uh, we want to uh, understand is, uh, so we want to study, uh, to investigate better this time periodic spatial pattern and the presence of, of bifurcation, which seems to be, un becomes unstable. Uh, it could be interesting to understand the scaling variance problem. So when you change the domain, so to, to see what uh, kind of patterns, um, so how the pattern change uh, when you change the domain, and especially uh, towards uh, an evolving domain, so something that changes over time. 
could be interesting to apply the same approach to other cross diffusion model, which I uh, studied in during work with the uh, de Villet. So in the predator prey case, when especially you have two times case and you derive different type of cross diffusion terms. And we are also studying uh, cross diffusion on networks. So the same, uh, uh, let's say, um, a sort of discretized uh, system can be studied on networks. And uh, the same condition uh, uh, holds in the uh, network case. And the role of cross uh, of the eigenvalues of the Laplacian are played by the uh, eigenvalues of the graph Laplacian. So it's interesting also to see uh, what happens in the discretized case and um, with different topologies. Uh, also related to a small world, uh, random graphs and Erdos-Rainy and so on. And to see how the topology of the network influences the cross diffusion induced instability on the network. And something that uh, we have in mind with uh, Maxim um, is to study a fractional version of the SKT model, uh, because now we have a uh, PD to pass extension to fractional Laplacian in the spectral case. And um, to conclude, then the advertised two events that I'm co-organizing with colleagues in Vienna and in the UK. The first one is a workshop. Uh, it's uh, hosted by the uh, ICMS uh, in Edinburgh, but it will be online in September. And uh, uh, the second one is a school at the Outdoor Center of Mathematics, uh, and it will be in April, hopefully in uh, presence. So thank you for the attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now it's time for questions and uh, comments. Thank you, Cinzia, for your talk. I mean, ju just a question. Um, so you, when you talk about bif bifurcation, I think it, you have some oscillation of a, of a mode, right? So, uh, so it's not that the homogeneous solution is oscillating. It's uh, some kind of a... No, no, it's uh, the one mode which is oscillating. It's a, so, a one, one mode. Ah. Yes. I don't know if it, it's clear here, but you have a one yeah, mode. Here it's, it's, I suppose, really clear, yes. Yeah, but it, it, it probably is different from the Turing mode, right? So the, the K, which is destabilized by the hop bifurcation, is not the same as the one which is destabilized by the Turing bifurcation. Um. So the replication diagram is here. So in this case, so you are on the one mode here, mm -hmm. and you have a open bifurcation point on this branch, and from here you have this uh, oscillating uh, solution. Right, but uh, this di diagram does tell you the what is the mode which is uh, os oscillating. It should be the one, the uh, first one. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if I get, I got it uh, right. No. Uh, no, I mean, the, the spatial structure of, of the Turing, uh, maybe it's different from the, the one of, of the hop bifurcation. So the, the mode K could be different in principle. Mm -hmm. And do, do, you, do you see that from the diagrams or maybe not? From here, you say. Uh -huh. Because you, you, you show some simulations which you were close to both Turing and Hope, if I well understood. So, you mean the bifurcation diagram or the simulation uh -huh. here? The simulations. So, here, okay. Uh -huh. uh, so, in this case, uh, mm -hmm. you are not close to the Turing one, you are close okay. to the Hope bifurcation. Okay. No, but I, I, so I, haven't I, miss, performed, I miss that. So I haven't performed the simulation. Uh, so it's just bifurcation diagrams. I, I still have to. Mm -hmm. um, so the fact that uh, the, they are unstable comes from the bifurcation software and mm -hmm. uh, tells you that. OK. Thanks. Uh, just uh, a question. Do, do you have similar bifurcation when the, the first mode meets the other the other modes, the other cards? So, so 
You mean uh, here? So, so you said that, uh, uh, yeah, when, when the first car, uh, the car corresponding to the first mode meets the other one. Yeah, exactly, there and the, and the other on the left. So I this is, uh, so I haven't uh, studied yet. Mm -hmm. because, uh, so here, um, so it's interesting here because you have switched from a stable to stable, but here mm -hmm. you are, uh, so two, two modes are unstable and it seems to me that you cannot really get uh, stability. So I, for this reason, I focused on this first one. But of okay. course, so there is a change on the sign here. You can see, and maybe yeah. this also tricks some other type of... Mm -hmm. And, and did you find any uh, trace of chaotic behavior? No, not yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I also um, try to so look for uh, snaking branches, but uh, it seems that this is not uh, the case. So I was not able to find them. Oh. Some other comments? Otherwise, thank you again to both speakers. Thank and you very much. This is uh, the last uh, uh, afternoon of the summer edition, somehow, right. this uh, series of seminars. Yeah, so we hope we will uh, resume in, uh, in September. So let, let me thank all, all the today's speaker, which they gave uh, fantastic talks as well, all the other speaker, this edition that they, I think they gave a very interesting talks, all of them, both the established mathematicians and the uh, young, young ones. And um, we hope, uh, well, it, it, although interesting, uh, would have been uh, very beautiful to have you all here in Palermo and hope in, the, uh, in uh, May of 2012 to, to have the addition of, uh, of the school in presence, so to have you all here. And in any case, in September, I think we'll, even if with lesser intensity, we will uh, resume these uh, online talks, which have been uh, successful. And um, uh, we'll, we'll see what, what the organizing uh, committee will, will think. I think they will, the organizing committee will be able to, to organize a very interesting series of, uh, as well, like this one. So Maria, do you want to say something? No, no, only greetings from um, to everybody and thank you for uh, coming and attending this seminar and uh, see you in September, <laughs> even if online. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so thank to, to all the people that have attended and hope to see you soon, bye. Bye, thank you, bye. Bye-bye. Ciao a tutti. Ciao.